All right, guys, welcome to the 2019 BCS Classic. I am so excited that you guys are here to hear Cassie Joy Garcia share her story. She's the owner of Fed and Fit, and uh, obviously you probably have heard of Cassie. She's definitely somebody making a huge impact in the world, and you're gonna get to hear firsthand her story, which is gonna be very inspiring. Cassie, thank you for doing this. Come on up, and guys, y'all are gonna hear her heart today, which is the, the whole reason why I wanted to bring her here. So. I'm gonna give you a hug. Oh, oh, thanks, Charlie. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Hi. Yes, we're in Aggie Land. So, like you said, my name's Cassie Joy Garcia. I, I have to say this because I get an opportunity. I'm an Aggie Land. I'm a member of the Fight in Texas Aggie Class of 2008. Ooh. All right. <laughs> Some complimentary whoops. Um, like you said, I am the owner and founder of FedandFit.com. Other titles, you know, as we go through the years, we acquire more titles we get to put into our little Rolodex on our business cards. I've been an author of two books. The third one's coming out in the spring of 2021. Uh, so exciting. And let's see, editor for fedandfit.com at this point. I'll talk about how that's evolved from personal blog to now I, I get to play a part in the role and not be the whole show, which is really exciting. And then also, let's see, oh, hi, I get to be mom, which is probably my favorite title, um, and wife, of course, not to mention a poor husband, sitting there holding the baby, wife and then mom, she's back there clapping. So anyways, it's an honor to be here with you today. And when Charlie and I were talking about what I might share, there's something that I've actually never had. I've had the opportunity, but never really the right venue to talk about kind of what did I go through in order to put my health first, to find my own health journey and my own health transformation, and then how some of that is still mirrored in my transformation in building a business, right? And one of the big piece of that, if I had to really boil it down, it's in it with imposter syndrome. Is anybody here familiar with that phrase, imposter syndrome? Ever heard it, felt it? Uh, maybe by the end of this, you're gonna be like, oh, I, ha I have experienced that before. So. Let's rewind the clock, a little Wayne's World, <laughs> go back in time, is what I think about when I rewind the clock. And back in the day when I was a student here at Texas A&M University, this was, this was, see, I graduated class of 2008, so I came to school in early 2000s, and this is back in the day where there was no conversation around food quality, it was all about food quantity, right? And if you wanted to lose weight or if you wanted to see a difference in your health, what did you do? You ate less and you exercised more. And you followed a diet program. You, it's my daughter, and she wants to come up here and she doesn't understand why. Um, you would follow a diet program and that was it. And it was supposed to solve all your problems. And it was a total disassociation with, you know, what you are actually doing on the inside. What lessons learned are you carrying with you for the long run? So I started, I threw myself into these diets because I was unwell. My, my waistline kept growing while I was a student and I kept getting, I was sleepier and my joints hurt, but I didn't think that those were a part of my wellness. I thought, I'm getting older. That's just what happens. We just get sleepier and our knees hurt. That's just what happens when I get, I was 22. I'm like, I'm just getting older. <laughs> And so that's what happened, but I thought, but my waistline's growing, I know what I can do about this, I can diet. So I subscribed to all of these diets out there, all of these diets, because if anybody's been through this, you know the yo-yo, right? You throw yourself into a diet, front row students, right? We followed all the letters and we did all the rules, and then and maybe I saw a little su success with it, success, what I thought was success. I would lose some weight temporarily, and then as soon as it was over though, I would bounce right back. And I kept throwing myself into this yo-yo. And if I'm being really honest, why was I putting myself through this punishment? It was this reward punishment cycle, right? I'm gonna punish myself with a diet. And then when it's over, I'm gonna reward myself with pizza, beer, ice cream, and not working out because it's over and I've achieved the goal, right? I would fool myself into thinking, this is the new me. And I wasn't being honest with myself because deep down, what did I actually believe? I actually believed that I wasn't worth being healthy. I wasn't worth taking myself seriously. I wasn't worth actually being one of those healthy people. You know, do you remember back in the day? I mean, back in the day, I remember walking people, walk to class and go to the gym, and I would be like, oh, 
They're one of those healthy people. They're just like naturally healthy. They just naturally want the green juice and they just naturally are like, I don't know, I'll skip ice cream because I don't like ice cream. I just thought, or they love to run. I just thought, man, what would it be like to just be one of those naturally healthy people? And it was always a them, but that's, that's not me. And I think if I really get down to it, I really thought that I wasn't worthy or deserving of that life. I think if I really boil it down, that's what it's about. And that's really what I'm going to focus on today and talk about because what, I got, what got me over that hump was boiling it down to that really basic nugget of what am I worth and where is my worth, right? Where am I placing my worth? And where I was placing it was in myself, you know, my prideful, this is my perspective of myself, not realizing necessarily that or believing that I'm worth so much more as a daughter of Christ right? And that's what I'm here for. So anyway, so what happened is threw myself into all these diets. They didn't necessarily work for me. Kept yo-yoing back and forth. And then I thought, you know what? I am, I can, I have a brain. I might be able to figure some of this out and slowly started to transition. I slowly started to dig into some of the nutrition science, figure out the whys, empower myself with real information. I stumbled across inflammatory and anti-inflammatory principles, right? And I thought, that makes sense. I'm going to put anti-inflammatory foods on my plate, and I'm going to try to take inflammatory ones off. And after a little bit of this and doing things that scared me, things that I didn't think I was worth doing, <laughs> my poor daughter, doing things that I didn't think I was worth doing, like weightlifting. We're here at a CrossFit competition, and y'all, when I would go to the rec center for workouts, I remember walking into that rec center, and I'd see the real people, the real, this is what I thought in my head. <laughs> this is what I thought in my head. I just let it slip again, though. I would see the real workout people. You have to pass by them first with the free weights, and they're doing the, the pull-ups, and I was like, oh, Kim, not make eye contact. <laughs> And I would go right over to my little elliptical in the corner, the farthest one from the door, and I would strap onto it for about an hour, and I'd sit there with my magazine, and I would do that to punish myself for the pizza and the Oreos I had the night before, right? And it was just this awful process of reward and punishment cycle. And then finally, enough was enough. I had to do things that I hadn't done before, meaning I had to start taking my health seriously. I had to put myself in the driver's seat versus thinking that a program or a diet had the answers for me. And I had to start really, I think, believing that it's not, I'm not doing it for me, right? I need to live a good example and I need to really be my best self because that's what I'm here for, right? I'm here to be a really great example um, and if I can do that, maybe it'll help somebody else, right? I became more of a vehicle and a lightning rod for health. And when I put, made that my new mission, right? My new me, I'm me. I'm here as a believer and I'm excited to really help show what does this transformation look like is when everything turned around. So I stumbled across this paleo stuff, anti-inflammatory. Everyone's kind of nodding. Paleo is a little bit you know, come in and out of uh, the highlight reel recently, but when I started Fed and Fit in 2011, those were the primary focus of my recipes. And that's what I was doing, is I had found success. I, sure, I lost a grand total of between six and 10 dress sizes, depending on the brand you're looking at. I went from about a, t a 10, 12 to about a two, four. And the old me was like, ooh, like I was, there was this temptation to feel this weird pride over it, right? This really selfish, <coughs> self-centered pride over it. But at the end of the day, it wasn't about that. And what I was given with this, was this incredible opportunity to realize there was so much more available to me. And what I was so much more was I had more energy. My joint pain went away, which I didn't realize was optional. I was able to drive from College Station to San Antonio, where my family's from, without having to pull over and take a nap. I'm not joking. I would pull over, I would pull over, and I would take a quick power nap, and then I'd go inside and I'd get one of those little Starbucks espresso double shots at the gas station to make it the rest of the way home. I was, had so much inflammation in my body. It was such a vicious cycle. And I, anyway, so I had all this energy, and I thought, this is where I'm going to focus. I don't want to let go of this. I feel great. I don't want to let go of this new me and this person who I feel like I've been given a second chance at life, a new lease at life, and it's my job to share this and see if it can't empower other folks along the way who I feel like I'm, I'm one of them, right? I feel I'm the person who saw the healthy people and thought, must be nice. Like, I want to help show that there's a way over, okay? So that was my health. 
my health journey, and then in business, and I want you guys to know I would love to do some Q&A in a little bit, so if you've got some questions, tuck them away in your back pocket, and I'd love to get into them. But when business started up, Fed and Fit, 2011, I went, I went to the GoDaddy and I bought my URL and I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm worth it. This new, like, I'm worth it. I'm here. I'm for doing it for bigger things than just myself. I don't care. I know that I'm going to attract some negative attention. I know that family's not going to understand. This was back, in, most folks know what a blogger is nowadays, but that was back when you were at the Christmas party and I would they'd say, what do you do? Oh, I run a health and fitness blog. What is a blog? You can make money doing that? No, what do you do for money? I was like, well, I mean, I don't make any money at it right now, but it's a thing. I'm doing it. I'm putting all of my heart and soul into it. And so it was, I went up against a lot of objections from personal friends, from family members, and then from the world at large. And if you really want to throw yourself into an acid wash of figuring out why am I actually here and why am I still producing content, there's nothing like having a public business and putting your life out there to help you realize what the truth is. Um, and so I did. I started Fed and Fit 2011, shared as much as I could, Along the way, I was actually really cautious about sharing a lot of my personal story, but I would share all my recipes and a lot of my lessons learned, and I kept it as impersonal as possible because I was so afraid, again, being really selfish and being really self-centered and believing it was about me, right? I was afraid that if I tied my story to my business, then people could poke holes in it, and they would ask what I was already asking myself is, who am I to do this, right? Who am I to start this business? there at that point were dozens, now there's hundreds, maybe thousands, but there were dozens of nutritionists with online businesses, right? There were already books being written, there were already great websites, there were people who I adored in the industry, and if I really let myself be quiet, if I let the enemy speak into my heart, and there were a lot of days that I did, there are still days that I do, that he gets in, and I will say, who am I to do this thing? Who am I to put my voice out there, to put this recipe out there, to try to speak light and truth and share my own journey? Um, it was something that I ran up against a lot, and I think it really blocks a lot of people as well. So slowly, surely, one foot in front of the other, very slowly, very slowly. If I could go back and do it all over again, I think I would have been much faster because of that fear. I would be able to just say, you know what, we're just, I acknowledge you, a hat tip, you're there, and then we're going to go anyways. Whereas I really had to work through it instead of going around it at the time. So started Fed and Fit, and it's blossomed into, like I said, a nutrition program. I have a team, I employ this incredible team of incredible doers and thinkers and believers, and we're able to reach millions of people a month now with what we're up to. And I want that to be a huge, just, I see that as not mine. And it was once I released it and believed that I wasn't doing it for me that it really started to blossom and to grow right? And so once this imposter syndrome, right, where is my identity? My identity was in myself. It was in my own pride. It was in what am I doing with my life? What does this business mean about me? I'm at the family reunion. I'm at Thanksgiving. And they're saying, why are you spending all of this time on something that makes no sense? It's an industry that doesn't exist, right? I had all of my identity wrapped up in me. And then as soon as I really worked, and it was a process to release it and believe and realize that it wasn't mine to begin with, this audience that has come to me, it's not mine. You know, they were brought to me, and it's, I'm just a good steward of trying to relay lessons learned, relay the things that have been laid on my heart. And at the end of the day, it's all I can do, and that's all I'm meant to do. So um, that's when really things started to go. So when I realized where my true identity, when I placed my, it clicked it into place, so to speak, right, and really started to act from that area is when uh, the business really started to blossom. So that's a little bit about my journey with imposter syndrome and my personal health and in my business. And it's become a huge passion of mine. If y'all ever studied the Enneagram by chance, yes, okay. So those of you who haven't, you're like the Ennea what? Um, it is a personality test. It's one of the most ancient personality tests out there. So don't think it's this brand new, just popped up like a daisy. Um, but it has one of nine numbers and on the Enneagram. I'm an Enneagram three. So an achiever. And once I learned about the Enneagram, but I was also very freeing because I was like, oh, it's, I am the way I am. Like, this is why I am this way. And the threes, we really like to help steward people. This is how I was made. And in hindsight, it's so neat to see all of this happen. I'm so thankful for my struggles, and I'm thankful that I was made this way. 
because it is a part of me is to want to help and inspire and lead others through uh, some of the trials that I have been through. So what I wanted to do was not only lead folks through the lessons learned of my health journey, right, because I'm a slow learner, it took me a really long time and a ping-pongy path to really get to this state of wellness, and it's a moving target, right? Health and wellness is a constant moving target. And so having, giving yourself grace and understanding and knowing it's a process and being there through that is really important. So I wanted to help lead people through that and understanding that that is great. That's a part of how I was made. And then also in business, now trying to help inspire folks. If you have something that you want to share with the world, whether it's a blog, maybe it's just an email you want to send to your friends, right? Maybe it's something you want to post onto Facebook. Maybe Instagram, if you're on Instagram, maybe it's something that you just want to share from your heart or it's a lesson learned or it's a declaration of something that you're taking on. What I want you to remember is that there are people that only you can reach, that only you are a vehicle to reach, right? They're because of your hit past, your story, who you are, how you communicate, the people who do have, they trust you, there's only folks that you're going to be able to meet, and if you only do it, maybe it's one person, and that's what I always said, that changed my attitude about Fed and Fit. If I can reach one person, and if I can change one life, it's all worth it. If I can do better for one person, it's definitely all worth it, and I'm happy to have been used as a lightning rod, and let it be what it is, right? And I was here, I served my purpose, and so I just encourage you to really tap in, whether it's your own wellness journey, do it for more than just yourself, or if it's to share in terms of a public declaration of what's going on um, or what's on your heart with regards to business and what you're doing, do it because there's people out there that are just waiting for you to talk. So anyways, okay, so that's a little bit about my journey with that, um, but I would love to open it up to questions and it's the hard, the first question is always the hardest, so don't be shy, um, but we can chat about anything from nutrition, we can play Stump the Nutritionist, that's my, the scariest game <laughs> for me, but we can definitely play that one. We can play blog to business, how to get started in an online business. I'm an open book about all of that stuff. We can chat more about just kind of my mindset journey and things that shifted over time. Um, or I would love for if you could share a little bit about where you're at and maybe what resonated you or pulled you into today's talk and what you were really hoping to get away from it. Who wants to go first? You're on the spot, small group. I can look all of you in the eyes in a very short period of time. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Absolutely. Um, all disease begins in the gut. Hippocrates, <laughs> I think. Someone very wise and old said that. <laughs> Pretty sure it was Hippocrates. Yet, yeah. oh, thank you. Um, so just to restate your question to make sure I understand it. So how do you, how do you find the information you need? Got it. Yes. Yes. It's a great question. Okay, so I have about three different answers for you. What he's asking is, how do you motivate yourself to move from what he's saying is poor, bad nutrition approach to good nutrition? Right? Did I get it right? Okay. Great question, and I think the first nugget is I don't actually see food as good and bad. And I think that's probably the first stopping point. Now, I'm not saying that there is a difference between a kale salad and what's a nut, an Oreo. I don't know why I'm thinking about Oreos are on the mind today. <laughs> 
Um, but let's say I'm not saying that, you know, one isn't nutritionally superior than the other, but what I want us to wrap our minds around is they're both food, right? It's still something you can put in your mouth and chew and enjoy, and you're going to assimilate some of the nutrients that are there. And so I think the first thing to come across and to get over is realizing that there's not good and bad food, right? And I think that once we kind of pull that shame and guilt piece of it out of the equation, because when you have the Oreos and you think, oh, that was a bad food, that was bad nutrition, shame on me, I know better, I know I should have had the kale salad, right? If we think this is bad food, we're going to throw ourselves into this spiral of shame and guilt, which isn't going to make us want the kale salad anymore, right? And so instead of thinking about good versus bad food, it's all food. It's all an option, right? It's all a part of what's available to us. Now what we can do is say, I want to choose foods that are going to make me feel great. And I think that's how we mentally get over this, am I choosing the good option or the bad option? The eat this, not that, right? That puts me, at least, this diet person who has this history of cereal dieting, that puts me in a really bad mental state. When I'm thinking, eat this versus that, versus when I think, you know what? When I ate a kale salad and a sweet potato and some grass-fed steak for lunch the other day, I felt like a million bucks. I went through my afternoon, I had so much energy, and I want to do that some more, right? I was able to chase my daughter around a little bit longer, I wasn't sleepy, I wasn't distracted, I was less irritable, or whatever it was, right? And I think that when it becomes to, I want to choose to feel great, not this disassociated, this is good food, therefore I, need, I know I need to put it into my body. Does that kind of make sense? It's a little... It's a little woo-woo, but I think if you really sit down and think about it, I want to fuel myself with great stuff, and the other stuff is just food. Like, I, I, if I have an Oreo, it's not derailing anything. I'm not going off plan. I'm, not, I'm actually really not a fan of very, very strict nutrition programs at all, because I think that it does, what it, that does is it really teaches us orthorexia. It teaches us that there's good and bad food, and it teaches us that if we slip and we cheat, right? What a horrible word. What a horrible <laughs> word to apply to an Oreo, right? When we think of cheating, cheating on a test, I mean, being, it's, it's unfaithful are these things that, these associations with bad foods and slipping up, and that is way more than what it is, right? It's sugar, it's carbohydrate, it's a little protein, right? It's not, you're not cheating on anything. And so I think just think that it's food. I'm going to feed myself mostly with things that do really well for me, and I'm going to enjoy those in moderation when I want one. And that's how I approach it, and that's how, that's how those, those healthy people, right? That's how those healthy people are able to order the, cho the flourless chocolate cake at dinner and get up and go for a run. The two are totally unrelated to each other. They just had the chocolate cake because they wanted to enjoy it, and they went for a run because they wanted to enjoy it. Right? And so I think that when we pull back, it's not about good or bad. We start to really free ourselves from it. Is that helpful at all? Yeah? You're welcome. You're welcome. Who else? We had another question. Another hand went up. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, do you, yes, I would love to tell you about it. So. <laughs> Yes, I know, it's a really, so the phrase, the title of my second book was Cook Once, Eat All Week, which is, for those of us who are struggling in the kitchen, is very exciting proposition. <laughs> so Cook Once, Eat All Week is, oh, she's got it. Can I hold it up? Thank you. This is, oh, I love that. I hope it's got stains on it. That's my favorite. Um, so Cook Once, Eat All Week is my second title, and it is a different way to meal prep. So fed and fit. I like to see myself as, myself as there's a collection of folks who are reading and listening and liking and commenting, and I'm here to help answer your questions. And one of the biggest questions that our Fed and Fit readers have was, how do I get a healthy dinner on the table? Why is this so hard? I get it. I know I need healthy nutrition. There's not good food versus bad food. I know the foods to fuel my family with, right? They're there, but they don't, it's still hard to get a healthy homemade dinner on the table at the end of the night. And so, 
Uh, so what Cook Once, Eat All Week aims to do is to help you do that. If you're meal prepping on the weekend, there's a traditional meal prep, I think, is you get home maybe from church and you spend four to six hours in the kitchen cooking, right? This is what I did. We get home. Saturday, rewind a little further. Saturday, I would spend two to three hours planning. I would go through my list. These are all the meals I'm going to make this week. And I'd even, I'd be nice, really nice, and I'd ask my husband, what do you want to eat this week? He'd be like, oh, I really want that Mongolian beef. We have a killer Mongolian beef recipe on Fed and Fit. I'd be like, okay, honey, I'll make you that Mongolian beef. And so I'd plug it into the meal plan, and then I would go and I'd write my grocery shopping list to get all the ingredients on there, and then I'd rewrite it because it has to be in order of the grocery store. <laughs> because we don't have time to just do laps constantly. <laughs> and then I'd go to the store and I would spend a fortune on groceries because that Mongolian beef recipe, I'm sorry, but it calls for like, what, an eighth of a teaspoon of a specialty oil that costs $15 for a jar of it. And I tell myself, I'm so sorry, just leave it out. You don't need it. <laughs> just leave it out. And so I would tell myself, I'm going to make it all the time. And of course I don't. It just sits in my pantry. So this whole con, and then I'm eating leftovers all week long, right? And then Wednesday rolls into town, and I'm tired of the food I made, and I'm wondering if we should just go ahead and get takeout pizza anyways. And it turns out that this was a commonality with a lot of our readers and folks who, bless them, making two to three different meals at nighttime because there are different dietary needs. Someone's low carb, someone's dairy free, and someone doesn't like X, Y, Z, right? So cook once eat all week is a totally different way to meal prep and the idea is to keep you in the kitchen on your meal prep day to an hour to an hour and a half max. And what you do is, has anybody here used cook once? Obviously. Yes, awesome. So the idea between cook once eat all week is you take, we focus on a protein, a starch, and in most cases a vegetable, sometimes it's two vegetables. So let's say it's chicken and sweet potatoes and broccoli. Okay, those are your three ingredients. And so what we do on our prep day, oh, and we're giving you a grocery shopping list in order of the grocery store. You're welcome. The first time we sent it to the printer, it was not in order of the grocery store, it was in alphabetical order because that's what editors like. And I was like, no, no, <laughs> they're gonna rewrite it. Um, so what you would do is you would take your chicken, let's say it's two chickens, and you would stick them in the oven, or if you're in a pinch, you can just use rotisserie, give yourself a break. So put your two chickens in the oven and the potatoes, you get a whole bag of sweet potatoes, three pounds of it, put those in the oven and bake them. This is all part of your prep day, and we walk you through what to do when so that you're in the kitchen for an efficient amount of time. If y'all ever cooked Thanksgiving dinner for a large group of people, it's like the prepping and the planning starts three days out, and you're like, I'm gonna make this pie crust on this day, and then I'm gonna wake up the next morning, I'm gonna chop these vegetables, and the turkey goes in the oven at 3 a.m., and then as soon as that's done, I can put the sides in, like this whole mental gymnastics, and then by the time dinner rolls around, you're exhausted, because you just event planned this huge meal. So that's what, that's what meal planning is like for every, most folks who meal plan and meal prep every single week. So we walk you through what to do when, so that you're in there in an efficient amount of time. Um, and, then, and then maybe we have you steam the broccoli, whip up a couple sauces, you're done for prep day, go live your life. And then what we have you do is once you have these already cooked components, let's say the chicken, I had you shred the chicken breast and disassemble the legs and the wings, right? So you've got those whole set aside. So you have two different treatments from the same protein. And what we do is let's say Monday night, you get home from work, the kids are home from school, you spend 10 to 15 minutes taking these ingredients that you've already cooked and you assemble them into a finished dish that you put into the oven. So maybe an assembled dish would be a buffalo chicken casserole. So you take the sweet potatoes and you put them on the bottom of the pan and maybe you put some broccoli in there for bonus nutrients and then we take the shredded chicken, toss it in the buffalo sauce that you made or you bought, either one and then you sprinkle the top with bacon and chives, stick it in the oven for it to come together. It's a fresh dinner, right? It's not leftovers. We wrote it to feed four adults. And so I, when I wrote for four adults, I thought four husbands, because I wanted to make sure nobody was hungry. And then the second night, when you're ready to put dinner together, it's a totally different meal. Maybe it's a chicken teriyaki bowl, right? We take the other half of that shredded chicken, toss it in some sort of a teriyaki sauce, put it over the broccoli, maybe a little rice if you want something like that. And then the third meal is maybe a Greek sheet pan dinner with those chicken legs and the wings. So that's kind of how we approach Cook Once, Eat All Week. It gives you three totally different big meals and allows you to get some time back in, in your day and in your week and hopefully able to spend it how you want. And what we did, so there's 26 weeks 
of this meal prep method and cook once, eat all week. So that's six months. And we have nutrition information, considerations for low carb, dairy free, egg free. As nutritionist, nutrition consultant, we couldn't help because that's who we write for on Fed and Fit. So we wanted to really make sure that you had all the options. So those mamas out there making three dinners at night, <laughs> like save yourself, boil it down to the lowest common denominator. If everybody in the house can get behind chicken, sweet potato, and broccoli, flag that week and put it on repeat. So that's it is a very long answer to your very simple question, but that's, that's Cook Once, Eat All Week. And we have free downloads on fedandfit.com if you want to go check it out. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? How are we doing? Doing good. Carson. Do Oops, sorry. Yes. I, I get to talk to him anytime. Do you all have the Fed and Fit in here or the Cook Once, yeah. Eat All Week? No, I don't. I don't have it here. There's a good chance it's at the local Barnes & Noble or Amazon. Has it on sale? Like 40% off. Yeah, just do it. <laughs> it's on Prime, so it's free yeah. shipping. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's that's the yeah, that's the way to get it. Unless you want to support a local bookstore, and I'm all about that. If they don't have the book, most local indie stores, if you give them a ring and say, Hey, I really want to buy this book from you, they can get it ordered and Yeah. Welcome. Yes, sir. Nutrient timing, that's an interesting question. It depends. That is, my mom hates it when I answer with it depends. When she asks me anything nutrition related, I'm like, well, that depends on so many things. I think that it depends. Are you, are you thinking intermittent fasting kind of nutrient timing or more granular? Yeah, probably. That's, that's very popular right now. Eating inside a window, something like that. Yes. It is. So I think that. There's a time and a place. I think intermittent fasting is actually very fascinating. Um, if, so intermittent fasting, to give you an idea, let's say it's a 16-8 is a very classic intermittent fast breakdown where you fast for 16 hours and you eat within an eight hour window. So let's say if you had dinner at, you finished eating at 7 p.m., then it's just water, tea, broth, coffee, whatever you have for the next 16 hours, and then at 11 a.m. is when you start eating again. And it doesn't mean you skip breakfast. Okay, it just means that you delay it until 11 a.m. and then you eat. I still like the three big, nice, balanced meals within that eight hour window. So 11 a.m., 2.30, and then six o'clock, right? Those are your three meals. I think that's a very powerful approach for folks who are very busy and don't want to try another. For folks who like plans and they like following a rule, I think it can be a very powerful way to work on fat loss if you actually have fat to lose or gain muscle, right? It gives you a very powerful window. But for just, mo it can be very therapeutic, I guess is what I'm getting at. But for folks who are just generally well and they have great energy and they feel really good and health is really solid, then it's not something that I think that has to be dabbled in. But it's a tool that can be used if you need it. Now for folks who don't, aren't curious about intermittent fasting, um, I think that it's, I'm more of a fan of three balanced, three balanced meals than a bunch of snacking. I think that it's important that we let our hunger hormones rise and fall and those energies peak and fall throughout the day and really allow ourselves to feel hungry. I'm a really big believer in that, let the body work the way that it's supposed to work. And so nutrient timing from that perspective, if it's not fasting, then I say just let, have breakfast, let yourself feel hungry right before lunch and then have lunch. And if you're hungry too soon, you didn't eat enough. Right, add some more fat, some more protein to your plate. Maybe some more carbs. A lot of people are accidentally going too low carb when they pursue real food. Is that helpful? Ish? <laughs> what, what about uh, gut biome? Gut biome? Yes, I mean, it's like all disease begins in the gut. I mean, we definitely really want to make sure that we're nurturing those little helpers down there that are di really digesting all of our food and create and taking those nutrients and making them so that our body can actually assimilate them. And so probiotics are a really great, important part of a balanced, healthy lifestyle. You can also get probiotics from natural foods, so raw, fermented sauerkraut, right? Not stuff that's been cooked at high heat that's been in a can for three years. Um, but stuff that's raw and natural, <laughs> um, pro kefir, if you can tolerate dairy, there's also probiotic, dairy-free options out there. I mean, that's really important. And it's also important while we can supplement, right, with probiotics and make sure that our gut constantly has a really good array, it's also important to remember that when we, there are things that we eat 
and stress that we go through that has a detrimental effect on our gut biome, right? And so when I go out, let's say I've traveled, I've gone out for a weekend with my girlfriends and I haven't slept a whole lot and I've been a little stressed out because I'm ignoring work and I had a whole bunch of pasta and a whole bunch of wine, I know that I really, my gut has really taken a hit, right? Because of the stress, the lack of sleep and the not great foods that I've been eating. And so I will come home, try to refuel, again, choose the healthy option because I really want to feel well again. And then I'll also try to re-inoculate. A quick note though, if you're buying a probiotic in a bottle, try to grab the ones from the refrigerator aisle and then rotate brands, rotate bottles. Grab a different one every time because they're all gonna have a different array of what's included and it's good to get a wide introduction. Yes, ma'am. Okay. But do not like vegetables, hide it, <laughs> if you can. So I'm sure you've tried this but the really finely chopped up kale in the ground beef in a casserole, something like that. Um, I think mixing things in chili. We started, when I married Austin, i not, sorry, I'm gonna put you on, I'll use you as an example, but vegetables weren't necessarily, as him, weren't exactly a focus. And I started making kale chili as a joke to say, okay, you want chili, I will make you chili. I'll even buy the Fritos so you can eat it with the chili. <laughs> But I'm going to chop up really finely some kale to throw in there, really find where they really can't see it. And now it's to the point where he really likes it and he's, if I make kale without chili, he's like, where's, where's the kale? <laughs> I missed it. So anyways, I would say try to hide food in as much as possible. And also, a lot of the times vegetables are missing acid. We think that it's, they don't taste good because they maybe they need more salt or more seasoning. I have found that most people who don't like just vegetable sides, tend to like them more when there's a little bit of acid introduced. So some lemon juice, some lime juice, just squeeze that on there and see what it does. See if they might like it. The hydro trick book, what I like about it is I can make it for me. Yes. It. Yes. And you can switch it for them. Oh, good. Like yes. Good. <laughs> yes, Carson. You, <laughs> you, he asked, instead of eating vegetables, how am I doing on time? Am I doing all right? Instead of eating vegetables, um, can he take a fiber and a vitamin supplement? You know what? If you're really not going to touch the things, please take your supplements. Please take the fiber and the vitamins. Um, but asking for kiddos. You know what, I would also think about the fact that you're getting fiber and vitamins from fruits. I haven't met a kid that doesn't like a berry right? And so, maybe I haven't met enough kids, but I <laughs> try to find some kind of fruit, some sort of a raw fruit or vegetable, something from the produce section that they can get behind and try to get as many colors on that plate as possible. It doesn't all have to be, it's not broccoli or bust, right? You don't have to like broccoli in order to have a healthy, balanced plate in front of your kiddos or in front of your husband's, it's okay to introduce some other things. So like plantains, for example, if they, it's a, it's a strange ingredient, but you never know if you, have y'all ever tried frying plantains before? They're really, really good. So you get some ripe plantains, you pan sear it in a little butter or coconut oil, put some nice sea salt on it. The amount of potassium available in those plantains is phenomenal. And so just go to the produce aisle and keep experimenting, keep grabbing different ingredients that you think that they might like. Google, how do I cook this thing? Um, a dragon fruit, right? At least get them something that they can try, that they might be excited by, that they can experiment with. And then if they find something that they like, put it on repeat. I just say, keep, keep kissing frogs until you find the right one. <laughs> yes, sir. You know, I think, it's, I think it's outdated. How do I feel about calories in, calories out is what he asked. I think it's a little outdated. I think that, I think that the most recent literature, if you really dig into it, fo points way more to food quality than it does to food quantity. Because I can, you can eat 1,800 calories of Ritz crackers, right? And, and then go on the elliptical, <laughs> I, elliptical and Oreos. It's where my brain's at today, because I'm in Aggie land. <laughs> Um, and that's, that's how I lived when I was here. But you, know, you can go on the elliptical and be like, I'm going to burn a 200 of those Ritz cracker uh, calories. And so I think that 
Obviously, most people who are calories in, calories out aren't eating one singular food, but I think it's a slippery slope into not having an array of micronutrients on your plate. And so I think just try to wrap your mind around, do I have enough energy? Am I overeating or am I feeling full and do I feel good, right? And it becomes less about the scale. I would encourage everybody, if you are trying to pursue fat loss or healthy, you know, new milestone in your in the head, try to not step on the scale unless you're at the doctor, right? So make it that infrequent and make it more about how are you feeling? How are your pants fitting? How are you, do you have the energy to get you through the day? Um, and that's how you measure if you're really eating enough. And if you're having a hard time getting to that point, that's intuitive eating. Have you all ever heard of intuitive eating? It's this, like, I know, I, it's these, a lot of women are like, pregnant women are like this, right? I don't know what it is, I really need a sweet potato right now. Like, that's intuitive eating. They, they know that they need some of these nutrients from that ingredient. And so one way that you can get there, if it's hard to really think about that way, is to journal. Write down, I'm not talking granularity, I'm not saying I had 27 raspberries, but I had a cup of, ra or a, a bowl of raspberries for breakfast. I had these things qualitatively, what did you eat and how did you feel? And if you were hungry right away, think about, well, am I dehydrated? Am I exhausted? Did I sleep enough? And if all of those things are covered, then eat some more with breakfast. Yes. Oh, so sweet. We, we You're like nodding about, along. Uh, yeah. Yeah. How do you feel about macros? I think macros can be very powerful, just like intermittent fasting. I think that it can be a really powerful tool to teach people what is going on to their plates. If the wheels have come off and you're like, I don't even know. Am I supposed to eat one or four avocados? Like if people just for does it's hard to figure out how much fuel does my body actually need? And I think macros can be really helpful, but I think our clients and people at large, we, we need to know ourselves, right? If we are somebody who deals with orthorexia, who has a really hard time getting into that spiral of, am I worth it? Is food a punishment or is it a, is it a reward? Then I would tread very lightly in that direction and try to approach it the long way, but from a journaling perspective versus a hard calculation. Okay, sweet. I think that's about all the time I have. Thanks for coming, guys. This is fun. If y'all have, have more questions, you can find me fedandfit.com or on all of the social channels, Fed and Fit. And if you brought your book, I want to sign it. I'd love to.